Um, so thank you all very much, and uh, and we'll get going. Uh, quickly, I'll, I'll introduce uh, myself and Cody and Clay, uh, our experts here on the call. We'll go through some healthy building strategies, what works and what doesn't, talk about our R0 ecosystem, uh, the ease and efficacy of customizable solutions, and then we'll do a, a robust Q&A and, and really have a, a group dialogue. And uh, we're, we're joined here by myself. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of R0, have a background in technology manufacturing. Uh, my first business was in energy storage and I sold that a couple of years ago. Uh, and we have Cody here, who's uh, our, our most senior product manager, uh, and Clay, who leads our solutions engineering team. So here we are. So here's our first interactive poll. This is my first time doing this, so thanks for bearing with us. and. Uh, welcome your participation. So I, I want to quickly ask uh, uh, all of us who are here, uh, we have some idea of healthy buildings already. This is not a, a new concept to us. And, and we're trying to establish a baseline here uh, for what are the outcomes you're looking to accomplish with improved IAQ. Uh, and I'll give about 45 seconds to read through the answers and, and, uh, and choose your response here. Uh, but as we know, there's many benefits to improved IAQ and, and trying to get a sense for each of you individually, uh, and we can look collectively at the data after this poll, uh, what is your driving, uh, motivating force here? Is it reduced facility acquired infections, uh, increase employee safety and confidence, eliminate group gathering hesitation, improve occupant productivity and performance, uh, boost brand impact or ratings, or increase building occupancy? And you should be able to select multiple responses here if you'd like. Uh, but just curious to establish a baseline and get a sense of uh, really why it is that we're all on this call and uh, and some of the outcomes we can uh, attempt to generate with these strategies. But we can jump to the next side and, and see the results here. All right. So it looks like we're, we're pretty close uh, on the top two responses for increase employee safety and confidence and reduce facility acquired infections. Uh, a, a few responses in brand impact and ratings and occupancy, but it seems mostly on infection prevention uh, and employee safety and confidence. Uh, so so that, that's great to know. I mean, I, I think most of us here are on the call because we're aware that there are many positive outcomes to a healthy building strategy. That body of science is growing quickly and it's overwhelming. Uh, led by groups like the CDC, the WHO, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, uh, some really incredible organizations putting some science out around the, the positive outcomes with healthy buildings. Uh, there are a few blockers and limitations that we've seen come up time and time again for different organizations. Those are often around sustainability, whether that's chemical use or greenhouse gas emissions uh, or filter changes, often sometimes uh, blockers around cost limitations whether that's more manual labor, the cost of a retrofit or a system-wide upgrade, um, as well as just a lack of data. Uh, the, one is, I mean, there's an oversaturation of information, but sometimes data lacking on which spaces and, and which problems should really be addressed first uh, and what is the best way to do that and actually measure the outcomes. So today we wanna to talk about some different approaches and, and really see if we can get smarter on getting past those blockers whether they're sustainability, uh, cost, or, or lack of data and insights. Um, so if we just wanna move forward, really at, at a high level, I, I, you, all of you have some familiarity, R0, we're a, a healthy buildings infrastructure company. Uh, really in the wake of the pandemic and as part of this healthy buildings movement, we've seen the industry move in two directions. One was this great overuse of chemicals. Uh, and, and there is a time and place for chemicals and chemicals of, of course do have very real uh, germicidal efficacy, but chemicals are awful for the environment. There's a ton of manual labor required in their deployment. They're, they're horribly unsustainable. And then there's also no monitoring. There's no compliance to know what was actually done in this space. Uh, and lastly, chemicals largely address surface borne risk and, and do very little, if anything, for the air. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we saw a huge gravitation towards the upgrade and retrofit of HVAC systems. Uh, and there are many, many benefits to HVAC. HVAC is such an important technology, but the truth is HVAC was designed 
specifically for thermal comfort and for minimum viable air quality. Uh, HVAC was not designed to disinfect. So we saw this great gravitation towards chemicals and HVAC because that's what we that's what we know and that's what was available and that was language everyone was familiar with. But with R0, we really tried to look at the white space around what, what is the statistical and scientific risk that exists in a space? How can we actually get smart about modeling that based on our knowledge of existing infrastructure, how air moves, how microorganisms spread, and how can we actually measure the impact of different interventions at reducing that statistical risk in any indoor environment? Uh, so with that, we, we built a very sophisticated risk model where we can plug in uh, custom physical infrastructure uh, parameters uh, based on your buildings. We can model in uh, assumptions on occupancy, on climate, and we can actually show different hypothetical scenarios and actually look at the risks that exist in your facility. And then we've developed an ecosystem of product and we can actually show the statistical impact we can make on your given risk profile. Uh, so I'm gonna bring Cody in to talk a little bit about our technologies, but at, at a basic level, we have these always on, on-demand disinfection solutions. Uh, and then we also have the ability to monitor and, and generate data so we can actually learn about what's actually happening in any given space in real time. So Cody, I, I'm gonna hand it over to you to dive a little bit deeper into these specific technologies. Great, thanks Eli. Um, yeah, I think looking at this slide, this kind of gives you an overview of our R0 offerings and behind me as well. And the key here is what we're trying to do is, you know, we want to provide an autonomous, healthy building. We want spaces to be safer based on, you know, modern data science and machine learning. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, so if we start with the always on solutions, these are the complementary solutions to HVAC that Eli mentioned. So. If you think of we're trying to protect a, any given space in your in your um, uh, building, whether that's a conference room or open office area or bathroom, uh, these always on solutions can be tailored to that space. We can customize the behavior of them. We can customize the deployment of them. Um, we can risk uh, model risk before and after deployment to show what we're doing. So really think of these as um, installed products that are always on, operate in the background, provide hospital grade disinfection. Um, and you know we can often get over 12 air changes per hour adi in addition to what your HVAC system is doing. Uh, and then we can you know report all of that behavior back to a dashboard and you can understand exactly how your space is being used, how the devices are being turned on and off and what we're doing to um, you know reduce bio burden load uh, throughout the day as people are there and as people leave. Um, so the two products that you see here in this graphic, we have uh, Beam and Vive, which you also see behind me. Um, Beam is a uh, is a good product for large uh, rooms and, and and high levels of air disinfection. So if you think of conference rooms, classrooms, um, open office areas, gyms, things like that, Beam does a fantastic job of disinfecting the air at a very very high rate. And you know. This is an old technology. This is upper room UVGI. This is something that's been around for a long time, Rec a recommended method of air disinfection by the CDC. Uh, and what we saw when we uh, looked at this is this was kind of a, this is this awesome technology that's not really being utilized in the market. So we looked at the technology and said, hey, how do we make this better? And how can we make this applicable to any customer in any space, not just in hospitals? And what we did was we launched the first product on the market with LEDs, which allows us to tune the power. It allows us to tune the wavelength of the light. So we are always operating at the maximum efficacy that we can for any given space. And we customize that deployment uh, for that space. So if you think of, hey, we want to disinfect a 750 square foot conference room. It's a fairly big conference room. Um, we, can, we can go in and we understand how that space is being used from an occupancy, from reflectivity, from existing air changes per hour, and we can customize that device to deliver the maximum amount of efficacy while never breaching any safety limits and keeping the, the people inside safe. Um, so yeah, Beam, is, uh, Beam was uh, our, our first kind of uh, product in the IAQ market. And again, this is, uh, this is meant to address risk in those high risk areas in addition to what your HVAC and all your other solutions are already doing. 
If we go to Vive and you see up here, uh, Vive to my left, Vive is a, a new technology called Far UVC. And Far UVC is pretty special because it is the only wavelength of light that is highly germicidal, but also safe for humans. So it doesn't penetrate the outer layer of our eyes, doesn't penetrate the outer layer of our skin, but still provides uh, some ambient disinfection on air and surfaces. So uh, Far UV is very cool because we're, we can attack uh, microorganisms at the source. We can literally shine dis disinfecting light down in a cone of safety uh, as people enter a room, and it's completely safe for people and highly, highly effective against uh, microorganisms. So if you think of use cases like uh, smaller conference rooms, individual private offices, uh, assisted living facilities, cafes, those places where people gather in very tight quarters, there's some touch uh, surface risk, person-to-person um, -person risk, um, uh, Vive can help address a lot of those and complement to whatever you're already doing, whether it's manual disinfection or beams in a room too. Vive is kind of this targeted air and surface disinfection and a cone of safety uh, covering up to about 200 square feet per device. But both of these products, Beam and Vive, again, the goal is to provide an additional layer of protection to whatever is already in the space. If you've already upgraded your HVAC system to MERV 13, great. Uh, you're not going to be able to get 12 air changes per hour with an HVAC system uh, without, you know, significant, significant energy costs and, and upfront investment. So where these products come in hand is like we want to supplement whatever you already have in your space to address high risk um, areas with with modern technology and report all of that activity back to you so we can monitor how your space is being used and um, uh, how how our devices are, are helping address that risk. Awesome. So uh, the next next product I want to talk about is uh, these are more of our on demand solutions. So think of these as like mobile uh, rapid response tools. Uh, you see here to my uh, in the back we have the Arc. Uh, this was our flagship product, and basically we did, what we did there is we looked at uh, some hospital grade uh, UV towers, and we said, hey, this these don't have to be only sold in the healthcare vertical, and we we kind of democratize access to this traditionally only hospital. Uh, only healthcare specific technology. And what we found is, you know, it's a great tool for nightly disinfection as uh, janitorial and maintenance staff go through and run their routines. This is a rapid response. Hey, someone was sick. Someone, um, you know, this, this room is contaminated. This will provide a high, high level of disinfection in unoccupied spaces. So that can kind of reset your load at the end of the day. And then throughout the day, solutions like Beam and Vive can help keep that microorganism and bio burden uh, load low to minimize risk throughout the day. So that's kind of how we have our solutions broken up into these on-demand complement HVAC solutions, or always on complement HVAC solutions and on-demand rapid response tools. So if you look at ARC, we have a traditional mercury light. It's again, a portable unit. You roll it in, there's a LCD screen here uh, where you can you know, we have preset settings for your device and any room that you're trying to disinfect, um, you can just go select that room, runs a cycle, disinfects the room, you go to the next one. So what we've seen a lot of times is, you know, janitorial staff will clean a room, run the arc behind it and just kind of daisy chain that throughout the night. Uh, but again, this product, you know, reports back all of that activity back to a dashboard. So you can see exactly what you've done for your occupants. You can share that with internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, and it's providing a level of visibility to a disinfection process that's been kind of invisible uh, this whole time. So that's how those products kind of intertwine together. Um, you, we, you know, we have some products that reduce risk during the day, and then we have our arc uh, where at night you can kind of reset that bio burden load to zero. And last uh, but not least, we have uh, we also have sensors. So um, these are you know high density occupancy sensors. These can detect either head count and or just presence. So we can do uh, desk counters where like, hey, I want to see like which you know how many people are in the office every day uh, with a single sensor at each desk. We can also do uh, sensors up above uh, in about a 300 square foot space per sensor where you can actually see head count and occupancy and. And we can feed all that data back to the dashboard to understand how the building's being used, how you want to monitor or um, change your disinfection routine. Um, and you know, special thing: these are these are very very easy to use, battery powered, don't need a wired connection, um, can integrate into existing API systems. So just another way of 
trying to combine modern IoT and software with uh, high quality mitigation solutions to really create that autonomous, healthy building. Um, so yeah, and then I think one more slide. So again, on uh, R0 Connect, this is our dashboard that I've been talking about and how we report all this data back. So at the end of the day or at the end of the week, whatever you wanna sign up for through our customer success team, uh, however often reporting you want to see, um, you get a report of what's going on in your building. Uh, you can see how many arc cycles are run. You can see what the devices that are installed are doing in your space. You can see occupancy and trend line data from our sensors and all that. The goal of reporting all that back is number one, like to help you understand your space and to help us make sure that we're doing everything we can to deliver the maximum amount of efficacy and the maximum amount of risk reduction uh, based on our device deployment. So if we see after six months that, hey, one of these rooms uh, that used to be underutilized is now getting, uh, you know, is now just uh, populated all the time, like we may can go back and, and, and reassess like what we want to do in that space. But Clay's going to kind of talk about how we customize the deployment of our solutions and, and tailor them to your space. Uh, but this is a, a tremendous tool for us to be able to do that. So uh, thank you everyone for the time. And I'm going to pass it off to Clay to talk through our risk model. Perfect. Thanks, Cody. Um, and so, so as background, so I'm the director of solution engineering at R0. And essentially what, what my team does is we take all of this incredible technology that Cody and the product team and our engineering team have designed and built. And then we look at, okay, how do we implement that into the world? Um, how do we, how do we most efficaciously and efficiently get these products out in the world so that they're disinfecting your space? And that, that really starts with understanding your space. Um, so we, as a company, we've developed our exposure risk model and it's a, the risk model is essentially a tool that allows us to understand and assess microbial microbiological exposure risk in real world situations. So instead of taking a standard test chamber, we can apply uh, exposure and transmission rates to essentially any situation, any gathering room, and then we can model that. It's the, the core of our model is based on the MIT Byzant model uh, of COVID transmission. And then we've layered machine learning and then our proprietary efficacy modeling on top of it. So it's really a, a full solution suite of understanding a space and then understanding how to treat a space. And as far as I know, we're the only company in the world that does anything like this. And, and really much of my job and what my team does is we educate our customers and our prospects on, on their risk and their space as much as we do designing solutions. So it's, it's as much education as, as it is engineering design. Um, so our exposure model, you know, what does it calculate? So, you have a set of inputs. So this is this is your final output for a space. You have a set of inputs that are your environmental factors, occupancy factors, essentially what is the space and how it's used. And we'll go into that in a little more detail in, in the next slide. But then you have your outputs, which is your baseline risk exposure. And that's saying if there's one infected person with, in this case, COVID Omicron is, the, is what we're modeling here. If there's one infected person in the space, what is the percent probability that they're going to expose one other person to something in the, to, to COVID in that space? And then your final output that this will show you is your post-intervention risk and specifically your equivalent air changes per hour. So in this model that we show here, it's 700 square foot room. And it is, you know, this could be a conference room. Um, this could be a classroom. Uh, that it, it likely is a classroom, 20 people for four hours, all in the same space. Uh, and we show different behaviors. So, so the risk model will say, you know, what is the size of the room? What's the height of the room? Uh, what's the air volume? What's the mechanical ventilation coming in? So we really make these custom spaces, but then we say, how many occupants are in there? How long are they in there for? What are they doing? Are they sitting? Are they talking? Are they eating? Are they exercising? Uh, so we really try to, because that changes your risk level is, you know, exhalation and ventilation rate for everyone in the room. So we take this baseline exposure risk. In this case, it's high. Uh, anything over 40% we consider high. And we say, okay, we now need to treat this room. And that's where we get into the solution designing side of what my team does is we say, you know, we look at national standards of CDC and ASHRAE as the two primary that will say, you know, that six to 12 air changes per hour 
for healthy indoor air. That's really the, the standard, that's the current standard right now nationwide. And we say, okay, this is a high risk space. So I wanna put interventions that will give me uh, that, it will give me an acceptable level of treatment. It'll bring up to 12 air changes per hour. That's hospital grade. Um, it's above hospital grade disinfection. It's above the CDC guidance. And so a lot of what we do as a solutions team is based on what's high, medium, and low. So, you know, there's there's benchmarks that, that we can share of your high, medium, and low risk space. But like, let's say for commercial real estate in, or, um, or office spaces in general, we're looking at your executive conference rooms, your large conference rooms, your cafeterias, your fitness rooms, but also if you have open work areas where people are working shoulder to shoulder or hoteling and, and there are a lot of people sitting at desks or in rows and cubicles, those are gonna be your high risk spaces. If you're in the education world, you're looking at classrooms and cafeterias are your highest risk spaces. And then in, in the long-term care, you know, we're looking or um, assisted living, we're looking at dining rooms, we're looking at physical therapy, activity rooms, fitness rooms, things like that. Again, it's, where are people gathering really tight and they're gonna be there for a long period of time. Um, so we take all those considerations into place and we develop solutions that are tiered based on high, medium, and low that fall in accordance with the CDC and ASHRAE guidance. And so if we move on to the, you know, the process, this is, what, this is what my team, this is our bread and butter, is we understand and assess your space, uh, floor plans, site audit, we go out and we treat every space unique. So every building that we look at, every use case that we look at, like even one classroom versus the other or one conference room versus another, they, they need to be treated as unique and they need to be developed for solutions for unique, for a unique case. So we look at every space in your building, we develop a unique solution for every space in your building with, by using the risk assessment we bring it to you, we show you the before and after, which was the slide that, that we showed earlier. And we look at, you know, we also value engineer and we look at, are we gonna treat high risk, medium risk, high and medium, you know, we help educate and build this solutions package to, to put a layered approach of what's the best and most efficacious solution for today. What about two years from now? What about four years from now? You know, we have we've had clients that say, hey, look, we want to build for when everyone is back in the office. And we've had clients that said, hey, look, this year we want to build for our immediate high risk hotspots. And we've done both. And, and that's where, you know, one of the fun things about my job and what I like doing is working with customers to develop those custom solutions. And it's there's absolutely nothing boilerplate and there's nothing that's not based in science uh, and, and scientific justification for how we assess your space. Uh, so anyways, that's the, you know, that's kind of the, the lowdown on what my team does. Uh, I know we wanted to leave a fair amount of time for, for the Q and A. Um, so Eli, we'll kick it back to you. And uh, you know, I, hopefully we can, we can spend the next 15, 20 minutes going through some, some questions and having a discussion. Perfect. Cody, Clay, thank you. You're both uh, speak extremely clearly and eloquently. Uh, th that was great. Uh, so we, we do have uh, quite a number of questions that came in. So we'll we'll burn through them uh, kind of popcorn style. Uh, back to maybe Clay, this one is, is for you here. What is an effective high value yet entry phase strategy for UV pathogen risk reduction in an open concept office setting? So it's a great question and it, it's 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 not an uncommon question it's like where do i start so so i start in the places that first of all people gather so if i have an auditorium room that no one's going to be in let's not look at that first like let's look at our hot spots um so if you have desk areas that people are working at if you have conference rooms that are used six hours a day for meetings so that those are the places we start at and then we look at like a product like beam you know a beam is the, the beam has, is, is perfectly built for open office areas where it can de deliver a, essentially a blanket of UVC above the occupants in the room. It can cover a large amount of square footage in an open office area. It's, it's 750 square feet per beam is a, is a good metric. Like that, that gives you a lot of coverage for one fixture. Um, so we would look at, okay, where can, in this case, we would, we would start looking at your hotspots. Where are people most of the time? 
um, and where can we get the most juice worth the squeeze for, in, in this case, getting beams in that space over the top of where people are working. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Clay. Um, Cody, we, we have a couple for you here. Uh, two separate questions, both having to do with LEDs. Uh, but the questions here are, is there an application for using LED UV at a 395 to 405 nanometer for surface inactivation of pathogens and fungi? And an yeah. example might be restrooms with lights on all the time. Yeah, so this th there is an application, um, and there are companies out there that um, offer this. It's called deep UV uh, a lot of times, and uh, usually 405 is the wavelength that they work off of. What we found is um, with that wavelength, it's fairly low on the germicidal efficacy curve, so it takes a lot of energy to be able to inactivate microorganisms. Uh, for instance, there's a study that showed 54 joules of uh, DPV, uh, which is, you know, 405, achieved a 1.8 log reduction in staph aeris. And 1.8 log reduction, uh, you know, is, is less than 99%. Um, and staph aeris is fairly easy to inactivate. So we're talking about joules. Uh, our products, all of them, you know, Beam and Vive, like we measure their output in millijoules, which is one one thousandth. Of what the, the output for joules are, and we're able to get uh, higher amounts of efficacy. So, the reason we strayed away from 405 was because the energy input to get, uh, you know, the, our desired efficacy is just too much. And a, a more efficient way was for us to have LEDs that we could tune to the peak of that germicidal efficacy curve. So, you know, our products use less than two amps uh, of energy, uh, which is you know the same as like a laptop charger. So. There's not much energy input, and the germicidal output is very, very high. So there are applications for us. We decided to, to stray away from them just due to energy requirements. Understood. Uh, and also along the lines of LEDs, uh, what are the prospects for having a far UVC LED solution? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are a few companies that we've, we've talked with about um, using an LED uh, with far uv because they do exist they're in early stages of development kind of like you know leds were uh, uh 20 30 years ago so right now they're just not as efficient as we want them but they do exist and uh far uv is 222 nanometers this is a new technology to the market and as more and more innovations happen um you know we we are keeping our ear to the ground to 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 see when um something like that's available right now they exist they're not efficient enough for energy input and output but um, they do exist, and I think over the next five years, you'll start to see those pop up in the market as well. Wonderful. And, and Cody, just one more question for you while I have you, then I'll kick it back to Clay. But uh, can you talk about some of the testing we've done uh, for Vive on coronavirus? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So for all of our products, um, we do you know EPA approved, FDA good laboratory practices, um, third party lab testing. We do not make any efficacy claims that we do not have our own you know third party lab testing to back up. We don't use any calculated values to make efficacy claims. We do that only with lab tests. Um, for Vive specifically, we tested uh, an aerosolized chamber T1, which is a surrogate for SARS-CoV-2, saw over a four log reduction in that, which is 99.99%. We also did some surface testing with Vive as well, which we actually used um, HCOV, human coronavirus. The strain was a 299E, I believe. And uh, we saw in 30 minutes at a meter away, we saw about a 99.8% reduction. Um, and there's some other data points in there. That's that's the high one, uh, the uh, kind of overarching one. But um, yeah, we tested both a surrogate for that in the air and saw over a four log reduction. And then once we got to services, tested that exact uh, microorganism, a human coronavirus, and saw a 2.8 log reduction in 30 minutes. Awesome. Um, Clay, we, we have a question coming in about the, the risk model. If you could just talk a little bit about uh, it, the, the industry modeling that was used, we built off MIT's platform. Can you just speak a little about the, the process for how we designed and built that model and some of the precedent that was in place? Yeah, for sure. So the, the, the core of our exposure model is the MIT Bazant model. Uh, so I think Martin Bazant is the, was the developer. Yeah, Martin Bazant. Um, and the, the, the roots of the Bazant model are in the Wells Wild, Wells Riley research that started in the 20s and 70s. Um, so you've got Wells Riley and it layered up into Bazant. 
Um, and then what we've done is been able to, you know, you, you can take the Byzant modeling and then layer on top of that, especially from the efficacy perspective, we have all of the test chamber data that Cody and his team have done in the product development cycle. We, we can layer the efficacy and deactivation rates and light intensity. So we have, we've, uh, we have light modeling software that layers on top of the risk model that will calculate the light intensity from a beam or a vive. And then we know what that intensity does for deactivation rates and also equivalent air changes per hour. So that's how we can predict and model our EACH. Um, and then post installation, what we've done as a you know, proof of concept is, okay, prove, prove to us that your risk model is actually, you know, is what you deliver. And then so we can do validation testing post installation to basically prove that the modeling was accurate. Uh, the modeling also takes into account safety. So we, we know that you know, there's threshold limit values or, or daily exposure limits for UV and the light modeling calculates making sure based on different ceiling heights and room dimensions that it predicts occupant exposure levels so we can we know with the LEDs we can throttle them down from 100% all the way down in intensity to a safe level so all of that is goes into that one slide that you saw with the the visualization and the efficacy uh, and so all of that packages in together on top of the, the Byzant model, which is the core for the transmission part. And Clay, can you share just a couple lines on, on some of that on-site validation that we can do post-install that we have done to validate the model? Yeah, so, so we've done, um, there's, a, there's a couple things we do that are part of our pilot package. Um, the, the first thing is, you know, we go through and we prove that everything's safe so that the occupants are not being overexposed to UVC. And then after that, we have what are called dosimeter cards, which will show you accumulated dosage. So it's basically a, it looks like a playing card and you put it up in the upper room section or on surfaces that Vive is exposed to. And you allow it to be exposed to UV for five, 15, 30 minutes, uh, up to uh, one hour. And it will show the accumulated dosage. And you can correlate that to uh, the deactivation dosages of COVID staff, um, E. coli, like all of these known, uh, all these known uh, microbes. And so we can prove like the accumulated dosage in your room is what we're saying. And then we can also take uh, measurements up in the disinfection zone or in front of the uh, spot measurements essentially of intensity and correlate that to device output, which is what is shown in the, the risk modeling as well. Awesome, thank you, Clay. Um, Cody, we're having a couple more questions trickle in uh, around our uh, efficacy testing processes, uh, whether it's coronavirus staff, MRSA, uh, different organisms. H how do we develop our strategy uh, for these, uh, F for which organisms we test and how we test them? Can you just speak a little bit more about uh, that, that process and the validation we've done from an efficacy point of view? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, we have uh, Dr. Richard Wade and Dr. Carolina Kutras on staff who kind of help advise which microorganisms we should test against. Um, again, I mentioned we, we, we try not to, or we don't uh, advertise any efficacy claims that we haven't tested. So we choose, you know, common viruses such as right now it's coronavirus or SARS or T1. Those are all kind of surrogates for each other. Um, we've choose um, uh, MRSC, which is staph uh, epidermis, which is, uh, you know, a gram positive bacteria where we can kind of see what we do to that that um, bacteria. And it, you know, we don't make any conclusions about other microorganisms, but it gives us an indicator of like how we're doing against those types of, of bacteria. And then um, we've also tested uh, gray mold uh, on um, the Vive. So we try to pick and choose uh, fairly common microorganisms from each like category to, to try to um, come up with some, you know, some, some conclusions on how we would do against other microorganisms that are uh, similar. I saw you asked a question about uh, MRSA, MRSA. So we, we tested MRSE, which is very similar. Um, and again, saw over a four log reduction and we can send you lab, lab um, data on that if, if you're interested. But uh, we have not specifically tested MRSA, which is MRSA, which is that staph aeris. Uh, but we do, what we do know is that's fairly easy to inactivate. And we have tested other microorganisms that are um, a little tougher to inactivate. So 
don't want to make any claims about MRSA, but uh, we do know, you know, from our lab testing that we are effective against some gram uh, positive bacteria. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cody. Yep. Uh, we're, we're having a couple questions uh, come in around sustainability. And I imagine you, you each have probably a point of view as to how our, our products relate uh, to sustainability uh, versus alternatives in the market uh, and as a whole. Uh, Cody, do you want to talk about uh, some of the work you've done? Sure. Yeah. What we found, you know, uh, especially with let's let's start with uh, you know our on-demand solutions. If you look at Arc, uh, we found that you know this this industry we've it's been chemicals for the last hundred years. Uh, the the same ads for chemical disinfectants are running. They're they're the same that they were you know 50, 60 years ago, and that that kind of space hasn't innovated a lot. And what we what we found is look like this. Devices like ours, like ARC, can disinfect at a higher level than chemicals can with more with more traceability and more auditability, and we don't have to have those wasteful chemicals. If you look at um, for always on solutions where you're, um, uh, you know, supplementing your HVAC system, we don't have replaceable filters. We don't have huge energy requirements where, uh, you know, we're trying to move air throughout the room. We are shining light. That does not cost much energy at all. We have high uh, powered, long lasting bulbs that last, you know, vibes last over 6,000 hours each, beams last over 10,000 hours. And um, you don't have those, the, the, the filters that you replace two or three times a year. Um, it's just light. We're not moving the air. We're, we're just shining light and we're getting you know, hospital grade results from doing that. So um, we're tr our, our goal with these products is to, you know, as efficiently as possible, provide the maximum amount of efficacy in, in any given space. And that's where Clay's team comes in with kind of customizing how these devices behave based on the deployment. So. Yeah, and I, and I would say to piggyback off that, like, you know, my myself and my team, we spend a lot of time in, in buildings that were built in the 60s or 70s, uh, schools that were built in the, the 1910s. Um, and when you look at, you know, from a sustainability and impact perspective, ripping out an entire HVAC system to go, you know, we, because if we're looking at, we're not looking at thermal comfort, we're looking at indoor air quality. And, and if we're looking at a hospital grade EACH of nine plus, the amount of work and materials needed to change out an HVAC system and upgrade an HVAC system in a, in a school that was built a hundred years ago to hospital grade versus a wall mounted fixture that can be hardwired in and uses the same amount of energy as a laptop charger. Like they're, they're night and day. And, and we see that a lot of like, there's a lot of facilities that can't upgrade their HVAC. And now what do I do? So from a sustainability pro perspective, you're not, you're not doing all that construction work either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of a step beyond this question as it relates to a healthy building strategy overall. Uh, Cody, how do you look at CO2 monitoring or PM particulate matter monitoring as part of a healthy building strategy? I think it can be tremendously important. I mean, CO2 monitoring uh, is a proxy for occupancy um, and, you know, is is extremely important. Right now for our sensing, we sense uh, purely occupancy. We we don't have a solution yet that um, senses IQ CO2 or PM 2.5 monitoring. But for PM 2.5, you know, that's not our application. Like, we are not here to filter the air. Uh, that, you know, will rely on your existing HVAC or portable filters to do that. We are here to disinfect the air at the highest uh, rate um, on the market and at the most efficient way on the market. So for PM 2.5, that's kind of a, a different application to what we use as part of the entire healthy building strategy. Tremendously important. And that's where you can supplement with a, a, an existing HVAC system or, you know, portable filters. But what we're trying to do is reduce bio burden load. And um, that isn't always reflected in, in PM 2.5. So for CO2, I think uh, one of the biggest, um, you know, benefits of CO2 monitoring is it is a proxy for occupancy. And you can see how long and how many people have been there based on CO2 levels. Um, we're just doing that through raw occupancy at this point. So, And, mm -hmm. and I will say in from stuff we've seen with CO2 monitoring, we've had, there's a lot of buildings that recirc their air. 
And, and so first of all, like we complement HVAC, we're not trying to replace HVAC. Um, and, and that's what my team does. Like we love to see good air, air rate, air flow rates in buildings. But we also see, we have CO2 monitoring in some of our pilot studies that we're doing in our clinical research studies. And the, the CO2 monitors are saying that there's students in a room and there's no students in the room. It's actually a storage room, but it's, there's so much CO2 being recirculated in the building. So there's, um, that's just kind of another thought is, is how is the HVAC being used? And uh, when you look at CO2 loads and particulate loads, like we're, we're refiltering a lot of it through the building. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then have, are you guys familiar with any studies that have been coming out uh, around the success of healthy building strategies at uh, reducing facility acquired infections? So we have a couple internal studies that are in process that we that we're working on. Um, we don't have we're not we don't have the results publicly available yet, but those will be available soon. Um, we have partnered with Mayo Clinic and partnered with uh, you know other companies uh, across healthcare schools to to try to take hey this is our deployed product in your space here's the outcome after they've been deployed for six or eight months those results none of those studies are public yet but uh, we can share those once they get to that point um, what we do have is the efficacy data we can show bio burden reduction um, but for the outcome of like you know for a school absenteeism or for a hospital HAIs like we don't have that data quite uh, available quite yet but both yeah. both are ongoing like we've installed yeah. in, in both types of facilities and and the research is actively being conducted. Hmm. Wonderful. Okay, well, Cody, Clay, thank you so much for your expertise and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we will polish up this FAQ and we'll send out an email after this uh, with the polished FAQ uh, as well as a recording of this presentation. Um, and, and thank you all for joining and, and please feel free to reach out to us online and we can set up a introductory uh, call and, and just have a more custom discussion on your needs. Um, so thanks for joining us and look forward to staying in touch. All right. Thanks guys.